Hey everyone, this week we have Drs. Leah Claiborne and Carlos Simon. They are both university professors. Leah is an amazing pianist and scholar, and Carlos is a phenomenal composer. They are going to talk to us today about systematic racism and their individual work with African American composers. Welcome back. We are so excited to have another power music couple with us. We have Leah Claiborne, Carlos Simon, pianist, composer. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. We're excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Carlos and Leah are, I think, like our fourth couple that we've had on, maybe I third. I think so. Yeah, third yeah. fourth. So we we actually, we like that you guys are a musical powerhouse couple. This is so exciting. <laughs> um, we like to start with the cheesy questions. We need to know, our audience to know how you met. But before you tell them how you met, just tell them what you individually do, and then we'll get there. Uh, well, I'll start where I'm a composer and a professor at uh, Georgetown University. He's so modest, right? I'm just like waiting for more. We should have had you guys introduce each other. Oh, can you do that? Let's do that. That's a good look. Yes, let's start oh. over. Leah, introduce Carlos. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so this is Dr. Carlos Simon, all in his glory. Um, Carlos is a Georgetown uh, pro assistant professor mm -hmm. um, of composition. Um, he teaches film music, uh, theory, and um, composition uh, to students. Um, he's also just a fantastic person uh, and composer um, working on film music, orchestral music. Um, is that, is that That's good? Fair. That's fair. Is that fair? That's fair. Comes from a long lineage of um, creatures in his family. And I feel like that really um, influences his music. There's always um, that type of element, whether it's storytelling, gospel, um, African-American influences within his music. I feel like no matter what genre he's doing, that's what is, you know, the makeup of his music. Your wife's You're winning. <laughs> She's winning, Carlos. You know, okay. <laughs> Your so turn. It's my turn. Okay. <laughs> All right. Dr. Leah Claiborne is assistant professor at University of District of Columbia. Uh, and her research and her uh, forte is in um, music of African Americans, and namely piano music of African Americans. And uh, she is a phenomenal uh, teacher, a professor. Uh, she has not only a private studio, but also uh, students at the university. Um, it's several projects outside of the university that, that are geared to our professionalism. And from Frederick, Maryland, uh, and uh, it's 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 amazing to the to that she's doing what she's doing and and sort of moving, pushing the envelope when it comes to uh, exposing new works and uh, exposing young. Uh, performers to, to uh, African American composers, which is uh, a, a truly, a truly, truly, truly a gift. You did good. Ooh. That's Ooh. awesome. Actually, I like it when you know you You're get to. Starting that. off good. <laughs> You're you starting that. off good. <laughs> Y'all started a new trend on the show. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to know, like, how did you guys meet? Yeah, um, you want to tell it because I always get it wrong every time. You get it wrong? I, um, I add stuff to it. Okay. Well, um, we met at Michigan, University of Michigan, um, where we both started the DMA program. Um, I guess, like, how, how did we meet? Meet. I was already at Michigan for my master's, um, and I was part of this group, leading this group called, it was initially called... Um, Black Council. Black Arts Black Arts Council. Council. Well, it sounds like uh, witchcraft. Right. We we changed Harry the Potter's name. Everything. Yeah, we changed the name <laughs> later to Multicultural Arts Council. Um, but it's basically 
black students, students of color coming together um, in the School of Music. It's just a, you know, a good community um, for that. Um, so my, I guess the summer after I had finished my master's um, leading that group, there was a phenomenal woman um, who was kind of like the mother, you know, of this, the School of Music. Uh, and she was like, these are the new people. These are the new African-Americans uh, coming in for the next school year, whether it be master's, undergrad, uh, or DMA. Of course, Carlos was part of that list. Um, so just, you know, extending like a welcome, you know, um, if you need anything, I'm here. Um, you know, Carlos kind of took me up on that, to try to be helpful yeah. um, with him coming in to Michigan. Um, and then I think we just had like a really strong friendship yeah. and, you know, there weren't too many of us in the DMA program <laughs> for one. So it was just natural to be able to kind of vent, um, spend time together, just be real and transparent mm -hmm. um, with that program. You all know how tough that can be. Um, yeah. And then we just kept leaning on each other, I guess. And mm -hmm. we still just kind of lean on each other <laughs> yeah, for these yeah. things. Yeah. Truly, I, I will say that just, I, I I personally would have made it without Leah uh, uh -huh. at, at Michigan because I come from Atlanta and I've been around black people all my life. And so moving to Michigan where it was the flip, you know, I was the only black man in the room. Um, and, you know, she'd been there already two years. And so, like, I just need somebody like and she was there for me, you know, because I was I was going crazy. I really was. <laughs> 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 I really was, to be honest with you. But you know what the funny thing is now is that, like, Carlos, like, he needed me in Michigan because it was, like, a cultural shock for him. Like, he'd always been around Black people. But then, like, for me, like, he said, like, I'm from Frederick. Some people call it, like, Fred Neck. It's just, you know, <laughs> it is where I'm from, and I'm proud of it. Like, I, I love it. But for me now, I'm working at Historically Black College. Completely new. Completely new environment for me. So, like, now I'm just, like, I mm. ask him, like, lean on him for – for that because he's so used to that and I'm not. So, you know, it works out. It works out. Yeah, we yeah, we totally get that. I mean, especially being um, you know, we didn't meet at the University of Texas. We missed each other by a semester. But, you know, we totally, you know, get where you're coming from, especially like being few in your in your program. So it was the same. Somebody was like, you know, the other black person that's <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you maybe meet them. <laughs> And look at where we all are now. Exactly. <laughs> We're all coupled up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, Carlos, do you have anything else to add to Leah's story? Uh, you know, I think she got it right. She got it right. Got this it. is right. cute. <laughs> I'm already liking this interview. Okay. Let's start from, um, we, and this can be individually, like, how did you guys get into music? Uh, well, I was, well so Leah mentioned that, um, you know, I come from a very... Uh, religious background, family background, um, four generations of preachers, um, and they all started their churches, you know, uh, with their families, you know, and uh, my dad was no exception, you know, so he started the church in Atlanta in 1996, um, and he needed, you know, a, a minister of music, he needed usher boy, and, and, you know, whatever ministry you could think of, he needed it. And the children, five kids, uh, kind of served in different areas, you know, and I was music, you know, so I come from a very musical, everybody in my family plays some instrument, um, whether sings or piano or something like that. And so it was natural for me to kind of slip into uh, playing uh, organ and piano. So I started playing by ear, which is, you know, a tradition in my family and just kind of listening to music and figuring things out on my own. And then developed into like reading music in high school and and um, uh, uh, college. So yeah, that, it, it's natural transition into that. Wow, I can definitely relate to that. Like I'm a preacher's kid as well, yeah. and like like my dad went to seminary in Atlanta, so <laughs> there's a lot of oh, similarity. Yeah. There. <laughs> IGC, right? I think you said he's on the board there, but Gammon. Um, okay, Gammon. Yeah. 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 Martin played trombone, so he could not be roped into the music minister of no, the church. No, I wasn't the music minister, but actually I played bass. Like, I was playing oh, yeah. bass in the church before I even started trombone, and it was wow. by ear, too. But you know what? Uh, funny story. Uh, my mom, she plays trombone, and her dad, who's a preacher, 
gave her the trombone to play in church. So he he they had seven kids. So every she played trombone, uncle played trumpet, and uh, two other uncles played piano and organ, and they had a whole band. You know, a whole band. Wow. So, yeah. That, so the piece you played at Gateways, Amen. It, yeah. It, was inspired by her playing the organ. I mean, the the, the trombone. Um, wow. And, you know, so, um, yeah, yeah. And so, that's a killing piece, by the way. Everybody, like, you have to go check it out. There's YouTube recordings um, of that as well. But Amen by Carlos Simon. I enjoy playing it. Like, you have to check it out. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we could go with the preacher kid stories probably for a <laughs> long time, but I think Carlos got you beat. I mean, four generations. Oh, yeah. That that's that's deep, Carlos. Yeah. <laughs> You're on this wall, actually, over here. You see I see. Yeah. I see. I was gonna ask you all about that. That is wow. amazing. <laughs> you is gonna get your call in, in about 30 years. Is that what happens? <laughs> uh not quite, but <laughs> I'm already He's in already it. doing his I'm calling. He, he's doing his calling, you know. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> they say the same thing to him, like, when are you going to get your call to become a minister? He's like, ah, I'm good. I'm good. We're good. <laughs> All right, Leah, your turn. Um, was it How Did We Start mm -hmm. in music? Um, yeah, so, I mean, music was always in my house. My dad um, was a jazz bass player. Um, so, you know, I always wanted to be Nina Simone, like in every capacity that she was just like my idol, like, you know, five year old girl. I was just like, I want to be this, this woman. Um, because I mean, for her, she, to me, she definitely just represented an artist, right? Um, whether we put these categories around her as jazz or classical, she was just an amazing artist. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I told my dad I wanted to play piano. My sister was already actually playing piano, um, older sister. Um, so I think part of it was also just, okay, little sibling sees, you know, big sibling getting to do this. I want that as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I my dad really, really wanted us to start with classical um, because he, jazz musician, doing gigs, a lot of his training was just, you know, being put in the situation and playing by ear quickly, right? Um, and later, then he started developing the reading. Um, and he wanted us, both my sister and I, just to have a really good foundation technically uh, in reading as well. Um, so I started at age five um, with a really fabulous teacher. Uh, she definitely became like my godmother more than a teacher. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it just, it stuck. I would say, unfortunately for me, I never branched out to jazz. It's, but it's still, you know, one of my, it's still one of my passions. You know, I still love the music. Um, we'll still listen to it, you know, all the time. But um, yeah, I just kind of stuck, stuck with the classical. But I also feel like now, now I like, I feel like where everything kind of comes together. Um, I definitely wasn't raised playing any piano music by black composers, um, as you know, Artina. Um, it just, it wasn't exposed to me. So now I, I feel like, you know, this is my space and I'm really just loving being in it. Leah's so classy. She wanted to be Nina Simone. I thought, <laughs> I growing up, I wanted to be Missy Elliott. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. <laughs> it's always so put a bit of that too. <laughs> You know, we I swear I was the next Missy Elliott. <laughs> it's so funny because we were last, the other night. We were we just kind of went down the YouTube rabbit hole of watching like '90s uh, music videos, uh -huh. and we watched like I don't know ten Missy Elliott videos back to back. It was back like two back. in the yeah. morning. We were just like, we love Missy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, her videos were hot back then. It <laughs> was so hot. Yeah, she like, was that, like, she was out there, and like she was that. big for black female too. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like yeah. I was like, no one else was doing that. No one yep. else. And she was just like so secure in her, you know, in herself. I was just like, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that didn't happen, obviously. But even better is I get to be a professor. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we are. so speaking of, I want to dive a little bit deeper. Uh, you know, Leah, Carlos has mentioned, you've mentioned sort of this um, desire and need and how much you promote black composers and i think your work is amazing you've been doing some stuff for the francis clark center you have a new core series yes mm -hmm. um you all should go check that out i think that well you can tell them how to find it and everything but what do you think got you from like you mentioned basically your whole training pre-college no 
Black composers to really having this passion and being a leader in the field on this research? Yeah, I think it all happened at Michigan. Um, when I got to Michigan, my advisor, uh, Dr. John Ellis, um, still an advisor mentor, right, uh, will be lifelong. Um, he had asked me if I had done any music by Black composers. Um, his teacher was Arthur Cunningham, really another Please do check out Arthur Cunningham's music. Absolutely another phenomenal uh, African-American composer. Um, definitely needs to be performed uh, much, much more orchestras and, and piano music as well. Um, but I remember there was, there was a pedagogy assignment. Um, and I remember just thinking like, why was this never on my radar, right? Um, and I just, I just didn't understand why. I mean, I've gone like 20 plus years at this point, right? Um, never being exposed to piano music by Black composers. And I don't know why, but just never honestly interested in it. Um, and I think it's just largely because I never had a teacher who encouraged it. Um, and I never went to concerts with piano music by Black composers on the program, right? So it was just my own ignorance, I guess you could say. Um, and then, you know, I think for a brief moment, I was just like, well, I don't know if I want to to be honest, like, why, why are you asking me, right? Why, why not ask anybody else? Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of tugged with that not too long, maybe just like a, you know, a week or so. And then I was like, you know what? This is just my own ignorance, what's out there? And that just kind of like, just opened my heart, opened my mind um, just to exploring what was out there. Um, honestly, not think I would, I would find a whole lot um, but, you know, as we all know, there's just such a rich history, a rich history of scholarship um, that has been done. Um, you know, there no one right now is just like discovering new things. We're only able to play this music because of the people who have came before us, um, who have done the work. Um, and I just feel like it's I always imagine it like being like this open table. People have done the work to put it out there for us. And it's just time for for us right now, just to, you know, eat, eat the, eat the fruits, um, and, and be nourished, uh, by it. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of where I started. And then what I was further thinking is, you know, if I am someone <laughs> African-American, African-American female who went 20 plus years, never even thinking about piano music by black composers, I'm certain that's the story of most of us, right? Uh, studying studying classical piano music. So that's when I really started becoming interested in seeing what music was out there um, for younger students. Because my, my heart is definitely um, early education, um, starting students at the you know, beginning levels or intermediate. Um, and I wanted them, I want everyone to know that there's music out there for beginners, for intermediate students at every single level um, so that they can see that there's representation um, out there by by many many different composers including uh, black composers yeah that's awesome and that's a start early too like like you said I mean yeah that, you know, that's that's where you lay down the foundation yeah. so beautifully said and so since you mentioned this desire you have for young the young com pianist where can they find your course I don't want to miss that if you're listening yeah. you're like oh I want this for myself or my students yeah, so um, maybe I can share a link some maybe afterwards. Uh, but the, this is through the Francis Clark Center. Um, the course is called um, Unsung Heroes in Piano Pedagogy, 20 Pieces by Black Composers. Um, for, uh, yeah, 20 pieces, piano pieces by Black Composers. Um, and in this course, what they'll find, um, you can go through different uh, levels. Um, so beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Um, and what this course does, it's not just saying this is a piece by a black composer, play it, which should be enough, honestly, because <laughs> it's great music. But what I really wanted to capture um, that these, this is really fantastic teaching pieces, right? So I'm really looking at the pedagogical benefit first and foremost for all of this music. So not in a means to validate the music by black composers, but oftentimes I'm saying, hey, here's a piece that we all love. Here's this Handel Gavat that we always teach every single year to a student at this level. 
let's t examine why we like that. And here's another piece that's similar or can also offer something unique by a black composer. So it's just a way to start looking at the repertoire that we love. And I'm saying we should keep using that, but also including other voices um, that can highlight the same type of technical musical challenges or, um, or add something new to it. Yeah, so what I did, um, 20 pieces, black composers for piano at different stages, just so teachers, students, performers can see that it's not just until you wait to your advanced uh, pianist to learn this music, but there's music out there um, for all skill levels. Yes, that is awesome. <laughs> we need that for every instrument. <laughs> I know, go Sorry, ahead, Martin, there you go, for the brass pedagogue. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> well, well, kudos to your work. I mean, that's, that's absolutely yeah. amazing. Let's start, start somewhere. So Carlos, I have a question for you. Um, actually, not necessarily a question. One is a congratulations because you're a recipient of the Sphinx um, Medal um, of Excellence, which is huge. I mean, like only three people get this a year. So congratulations on that. Um, and I know that comes with like a $50,000 grant. Like, so what what all are you going to do with this? And like, and, uh, and maybe you can even tell our audience like what Sphinx is as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, Sphinx is a organization that is dedicated to the promotion of Black and Latinx uh, musicians in, in America, or well, in and abroad as well. Um, the award itself is, of course, you said mentioned awards uh, the fifty thousand dollar grant, uh, as well as you know some uh, career. Uh, guidance, you know, uh, and um, so the money, and you can use it any way you want. Uh, I, I'm a composer, so by nature, I, I want to use it to kind of promote um, uh, pieces that I'm working on now. Um, uh, one in particular, I'll just mention, um, uh, since starting at Georgetown, Georgetown University, I've discovered, um, not discovered, but uh, uh, like there's a rich history um, of of the university and its role in slavery um and they the university has i found like archives of bills of sale um of 272 slaves that they sold in 1838 um and so i've been in the process of writing a piece that sort of uh commemorates their 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 legacy and what they did for the university you know and but also you know grapple with this issue of of uh, systematic racism and how it's linked to slavery. Um, so it's gonna be a large scale piece, you know, and, um, and uh, we're recording in May and, um, and promoting it in, in 2022. And so it's, it's, it's a large, large, large piece. So, and I need funding to kind of get it off the ground. So that's just one project in which I'm using to kind of promote um, uh, my platform of, of you know, shining a light on African-American culture um, and also the underlying issues that come with the culture, you know, the issues of, of systematic racism and, you know, uh, and how it, 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 it really, we're all connected in this, in this fabric of, uh, so just using the music, that's all. And, and so I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to kind of get the award and use it. That's awesome. And, you know, going on um, systematic racism, because I know that you're using that, a, a lot of that energy in your compositions. Could you talk about your piece Elegy? Because I know like that, you know, was kind of you no know, coincidence with with um, with systematic racism. Sure. Yeah. Well, I wrote that piece in 2014. I had just started uh, at Michigan, uh, my first year of doctoral study. And uh trade the, the issue of Trayvon Martin happening you know murder of Trayvon Martin and then Michael Brown then Eric Garner and then there was just so many others added to the list and you know I I as a black man I was scared I was um you know angry I was frustrated and you know for a lot for about maybe a week or so I was just physically sick you know I I just felt sick to my stomach and I needed music to kind of to to ha as an outlet to kind of express some of my feelings. And uh, Elegy sort of came about out, out of that that experience. And here we are, 2020, and the list has grown exponentially, right? 2021. Yeah, it's 2021. <laughs> I got used to it. It's okay. 20, it's such right. a bad year. It just keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to say it, but <laughs> right. And so you know, it's just this. 
the work is really just kind of highlighting um, my feelings about it. You know, it was a personal thing. Um, and I really didn't write it to, to have, you know, the, that much exposure. I just wanted to kind of get it out. And um, yeah, and just, yeah, so that's the piece. And uh, it has, I guess, shined a lot on, again, the systematic racism and um, that's been happening in this country. So let's okay. talk about it. Yes. Right. <laughs> so right. we so I love it. Well, one, I love that you all have just repeatedly mentioned your African American influences, not only just because you are black, but into your music and your career. And I'm curious from both of you, either of you can answer this, is like how do you see systematic racism playing out in the classical spaces or institutions? Mm preloaded our team. I know. You can just say what you want to say and you can leave the other things for an outtake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean it's it's loaded. I I feel that it's a direct proportion what we see happening in America um with systematic racism. Of course, we see it um in music and classical music. Classical music as we all know, um it's you know, people consider it an elitist art form, mm -hmm. right? Um that some people believe started with, you know, Eurocentric thought, Eurocentric composers. Um, that's who we celebrate. That's who we kind of honestly bow down to um, and worship in a very um, unsettling way, I feel. Um, and just with like systematic racism, I mean, it's generation after generation after generation that's taught in this way, yeah. right? Um, so it's, it, it just parallels what's happening um, in the country. Um, and I f hopefully feel, hopefully feel we're at a point right now where there's just, we can't take any more of it, or at least that it's all starting to come out, which we all know probably of people of color, um, of Af as African Americans, it's always been um, just this hate and evil that's been boiling, you know, at the belly um, of society. And finally, it's just kind of, <laughs> I don't want to say regurgitating, but it's it's all kind of coming out, right? Um, we, we saw this, what, two weeks ago um, here in DC, right? It's just, it's not shocking, right? It, it's not shocking to us. It's kind of like, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, but we know, we know because we live it, we live it. And I, I feel like that's what's happening. Um, this is what's happening in classical music as well. We just, we have to come, we have to come to terms with the ugly, uh, with the evil and with the hate um, and with this worshiping of white Eurocentric um, elitism that's kind of just hovered around classical music and, um, I don't know, that's in, I guess, in a nutshell. And mm -hmm. it happens, um, it's in our performances, right? Mm -hmm. It's in our education. And, you know, as a teacher, I mean, that's just kind of where I'm really hovering. And it's just, it's so heavy because if we keep teaching in this way, it's not going to get fixed. So for me, it's just, it's about the education and just really trying to change the system. That's what we're all trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> change the system. Yeah. Um, make just, do something. Yeah, and it, it also is like understanding the system itself. Like, how did Beethoven and Mozart become these staple composers, right? And it's because scholars, musicologists, you know, historians, and and performers, they sort of they they, they crystallize or can't just crystallize the the, the 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 canon, you know, and and the, the repertoire. Um, and we we lift these composers up in high esteem uh, in the concert space as well as in education. Um, and so, like, I think if we want to see a change, we, 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 it starts with um, educators and the pedagogues uh, and including it into the, the curriculum. Um, and so it, it, it's important that we, we understand that um, education is important um, and it, it takes time. You know, we got, we got a long time to kind of crystallizes uh, African-American composers, but composers of color and uh, women composers and just kind of bring it up, uh, bring the, the, the repertoire up and, in, and include all these things. So um, I'm happy that we're all here. We're all pedagogues. <laughs> we're, we're a part yeah. of the solution. So I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but yeah. you know what I'm saying? 
No, no, definitely. I mean, and I know I feel convicted because, yeah, I mean, if I get the list of what we're doing, like in an orchestra, I'm like, it was Bruckner. I mean, of course, you know, brass players like, oh, we get to play Bruckner because we've been conditioned. Yes, it's great music, and we've been, but we've been conditioned for years, like, you know, like get excited for stuff like this. But, you know, like, yeah, let's get excited for playing like George Walker, playing Florence Price, playing Carlos Simon. I mean, the music is dope. You know, I mean, I could play your music like all the time. You know, it's just fun to play. And if you're sitting in the audience, it's enjoyable to listen to. You know what I mean? But that's what we have to do as educators is, you know, this is really like our thing. Like we have to let our students know about it and just keep that trend going. And it needs to be the norm. And and in our time, we need to advocate for those people, right? Because I'm just, you know, sitting here. I need to get the names right, so I'm on Google. But I was, like, thinking about how Brahms and Tchaikovsky had these advocates, right, during their time that made sure that they were going to go down in history. You know, one of those was Hans von Bülow. He made sure that his that music was played, you know? So we all have a responsibility to make sure that the music is played and that there are also scholars. There's layers, right, that we're teaching it to the kids and telling them this is great music. Um, I was even sharing with Leah a week ago, uh, you know, one of my smallest students who's cute as can be telling me that she thought Chopin was too contemporary sounding. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carlos is <laughs> <face is> like, <laughs> but, but I'm saying that because she's been conditioned. She, she hasn't been with me for that long. She was with other teacher who was teaching Bach, Beethoven. And you're right. If you've been playing Bach, Chopin sounds crazy. <laughs> but I mean, all of us can be conditioned from a very young age. And I don't think we realize that it's even happening. And so work that you all are doing and like Leah, you mentioned, it's it's, it's really huge, not just for the now, but for the generation coming after us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, it, it made me think about a week ago, I, I saw someone post um, on a group, on a pedagogy group. Um, talking about this person was a judge for MTNA, the Music Teacher National Association, which just had, you know, their rounds of um, competition, right? And this person, you know, we, we all applaud this person for saying, um, you know, in, in all the judging that I saw, maybe there was maybe two people, I'm paraphrasing, um, two people of color um, that came up and they were saying like, we need to do better, we need to do better. And of course, everyone's like, yes, yes, you know, we, we need to do better. But, you know, I started thinking about it because I had I had students who entered this year as well. Um, and many of them played Margaret Bonds, Florence Price, um, Irene Britton Smith. Right. So, I mean, this is the thing, though. The judges would always say, thank you for exposing me to this music, period. Then they would go down to the Chopin, try this with the pedaling, try this with the finger, right? <laughs> try it, right? So I'm just like, it was a good like moment for me, I think, because it. I'm always just realizing it's not enough. It's not enough even just to share it. You know, it's thank you for saying, you know, thank you for letting me be exposed to this music. But at some point, we need to like start putting this music and saying, yes, this is worthy of discussing and having deep scholarship the same way we're going to talk about the scholarship of Chopin and the pedaling and the fingering and the nuance, right? So all I'm saying, we just have a lot of work to do, right? We have a lot of work. And I feel like at this point, we're just that um, we're at thank you for exposing us. And I'm just, I'm ready to dive deeper than saying, thank you for putting it on the program. I'm ready to talk about it in the same way we talk about Beethoven or Tchaikovsky or, you know, Anybody, anybody white, right? Yeah. <laughs> anybody A- white, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the music should be on, you know, the competition, competition jury, like required repertoire. It needs to be on like audition lists for yeah. to get into college, grad school. You know, I mean, it's not hard to be honest with you. It's, it's <laughs> not. It's so hard. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like if, you know, I think it's hard. It's hard changing those. Mm-hmm. 
That's those, right. Those requirements. Yep. <laughs> anyway, this is like a happy hour discussion. You all are listening in like, what happened to the show? Okay, so um, let's go another direction. I am curious, Leah and Carlos are individually, you guys are such great scholars and musicians and composers and all of these things. What do you guys do for fun when you're not playing? And <laughs> Carlos is like, fun? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is that? What is fun? Gosh, what do we do? Movies. We love watching shows and movies and um, it's, he's walking, I mean, I'm running. It's different for us because yeah. we're just very different. Like, he's such an introvert. And I realize now I'm be, definitely becoming an introvert, more introverted than I used, used to be. I used to be just like, ah. But um, so, I mean, the way we recharge is just very different. Carlos, for one, I mean, he can be editing scores and listening to music. I think that's absolutely absurd. Like, I actually can't even listen to music anytime I'm doing any work, you know? Um, so for me, like, I, I like running. I'm terrible at it. But it's something that I enjoy doing. It's something, like, I can make goals towards. You know, one day can suck. But if I keep doing it, you know, I'm a competitive person. Um, she so ran me, four miles yesterday. That's yeah. not sucking. Well, <laughs> but I mean, just you know, but I mean, yeah. So these are I enjoy running. Um, I like silence. I like learning how to breathe better because <laughs> I have asthma. Um, and then Carlos, I mean, like he likes movies. He likes music, and you know, yeah. two a.m. doing going down the rabbit hole of YouTube videos <laughs> <laughs> and listening to Missy Elliott. <laughs> right, sure that's true. <laughs> And we just got these, um, which has been fun, the Hello Fresh. We're not trying to like do advocates, but like, you know, the cooking kits, they, they come delivered to your door. So it's been fun. We did that at the beginning of COVID, just learning how to cook different recipes um, together. So we kind of brought that back recently. Why are you looking like? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to add, Carlos? Carlos, like, no fun. <laughs> it's like work. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's uh it's I I will say this, even though I'm not a preacher, um, I do love studying how preachers construct their mm. sermons. Um, I, I love how like this kind of listening to preachers and like hearing how they unpack certain scriptures or like, it's. it's or that doesn't have to be a preacher. It could be a politician in delivery or like how they say something. And it's, it's a, it's a way of teaching. And if you think about it, you know, how, how a, a preacher is able to kind of show in 30 minutes or less sometimes um, uh, a concept and then like have points. And it's like, this racks my brain. You know, one of our favorite preachers, uh, Howard John Wesley, uh, who's a preacher here, Alexandria, Virginia, um, and uh, uh, Alfred Street Baptist Church. And he's, every Sunday, is just like mind-blowing, mind-blowing. And uh, I just love kind of listening to, to the preachers in my, my spare time. It's like, wow. I'm smart. Yeah. Be a oh, <laughs> Gosh. We could talk to you all for a long time. Yeah. I don't want to stop it. Martin, do you have <laughs> any other questions that are left on the table? Well, yeah. Um, we always ask um, couples when we're interviewing, like, do you guys, like, ever collaborate with each other? Mm. Why are you looking at me? She's been um, helping me with my program notes lately because uh, oh. I'm a terrible writer. I, 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 Well, I can write, but I don't like writing, you know, uh, so she's, she's really good at it. I have been sort of helping, um, just writing her some music and we're working on some pieces. We have yeah. something in the works. I have a lot of <laughs> ideas. Um, it's, it's, it's a treat to have a composer as your spouse, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we're starting some early ideas of maybe some piano music. Um, I just, I, I, of course, love Carlos as a composer, and I just think piano is the best instrument. So, why not? <laughs> I mean, why not? Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he has, you know, he's already done some really fantastic ideas. Um, so, yeah, I think it's something that we're 
exploring. You know, we got married in 2018. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's still, it's still new. You yeah. know, it's in, it's in, we're in the new, we're still newlyweds, I guess you can say. Sure. So we're exploring these new, new ideas of being so like independent yeah. and now starting to like say like, I understand who I am as a person and musician. He understands who he is as a person musician and how does that work together? So it's an exciting time to, you know, mm-hmm. start, start examining these things. So oh, cute, they're newlyweds. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, newlyweds. I don't. Know. I feel like after COVID, you just you know everything. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> You're still together, which is a testament. <laughs> we can still smile at each other. That is cute. Well, I'm sure, and I mean, even Martin and I. This is year nine for us. This is big. Wow. It's about to be ten. Oh. Ten is August. This is no, this is your ten. You so. need to have like a ceremony. Ten year. That's huge. It is. (laughs) Hopefully we can go somewhere so that we can do that. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, you definitely evolve. I mean, I feel like we're constantly evolving and that's what keeps life interesting. So no rush. (laughs) Take your time. (laughs) (laughs) So this has been such a great interview. I really appreciate you all diving deep on, you know, deep issues of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to talk about it for people to hear it and not think it's just isolated events, but you know, you all are in DC and we're in Memphis and we are talking about the same stuff. So (laughs) it is a country issue and these issues needed to be discussed and not only our individual communities, but nationwide and really worldwide. So thank you for entertaining those questions. Where can they find you all? You can do individual or any joint places that you want to drop some links tell us where can they find you do you put in here oh no we'll put in the show notes you could just say it (laughs) oh okay well i'm i'm really terrible i'm terrible it's like something i'm working on you have a website though oh that's true leah.com yeah leah.com oh leah claiborne leah claiborne.com is my website Thank you. And my website is coliversimon.com. And then you can find all my social C. media C. accounts uh, uh, there as well. Instagram, Twitter, and, and Facebook there. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> Guys, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank it's you. always it's always fun to, to be with you all. Yeah, 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 man. We got we to gotta talk about some bourbon. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think I got a new bottle since our last hang. I think. Pretty sure I did. (laughs) Bourbon and barbecue, yes. All right. (laughs) Thank you all for tuning in again. We'll see you the next time. Bye. Thank you. Hot stuff today. Oh, yeah. That was a lot of fun. (laughs) Yeah. I just love that they were able to be so candid with us about Mm -hmm. their individual experiences, you know, both in institutions and our field and... Woo. Again, another note-taking session with the McCain duo and Leah Claiborne and Carlos Simon. We hope that you all enjoy all the episodes and all the content that we produce for you. And Martin, where can they find us? Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the little bell so you can get all the notifications whenever our videos drop. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and then check us out on our website at McCainDuo.com. Hey, and if you liked the episode, drop us a comment. See you next time.